Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, is there a new front in the war against the media in Pakistan? The killing of another journalist has people asking that question. The curious case of the Syrian blogger who may or may not exist, who may or may not be in danger. The ongoing exploitation of the female form that passes for primetime television in Italy. And birds among the angry activists in the Arab uprisings. Our web video of the week. Things were bad enough for journalists in Pakistan. Five already killed in 2011. 16 killings in just over a year, making it the most dangerous country in the world for reporters to do their work. However, the murder of Syed Salim Shahzad is different and has its own chilling implications because this time the chief suspect, according to other reporters, is not an extremist group. It's the Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI. Shahzad was an investigative journalist, the Islamabad bureau chief for Asia Times Online. The Pakistani media landscape can be a noisy place. Journalists have more freedom to report than in many countries, but they often draw the line when it comes to reporting on the military and the intelligence agencies, and that's a line Shahzad crossed. Our starting point this week is Islamabad, the case of another journalist murdered, and the story that may have cost him his life in a country where being a reporter can make you a target. Sahafi Salim Shahzad ki lash mandi bahaudin se mili hai Islamabad ke ek posh ilake se intihai. During his lifetime, Salim Shahzad only uh, identified one party from whom he feared a threat to his life. Sources say he was picked up by the ISI and tortured before being brutally murdered. You don't criticize the army because that's almost treason. You definitely don't criticize the ISI because you're asking for trouble. This event is a kind of game changer. It has changed the perception about the agencies. It has changed the perception to what extent they can go. First, the denial. According to Pakistan's state-run news agency, the APP, quoting an unnamed intelligence official on what he called the unfortunate and tragic death of Syed Salim Shahzad. It is regrettable that some sections of the media have taken it upon themselves to use the incident for targeting and maligning the ISI. Accusations against the country's sensitive agencies, the ISI said, for their alleged involvement in Shahzad's murder are totally unfounded. In the absence of any evidence, such allegations are tantamount to unprofessional conduct on the part of the media. The ISI issued that statement in response to extraordinary and public charges from Pakistani journalists. Syed Salim Shahzad reportedly told other journalists that he first felt threatened by the intelligence agency at a meeting held on October 17th of last year. He was called into the ISI headquarters to account for a story he'd written. He was brought before two senior figures in the ISI. They told him that they had abducted a terrorist, as they said. They said this terrorist appeared to have what they called a hit list of people they wanted to kill. And they said to Salim Shahzad, very, in a very friendly manner, if we happen to find your name on that list, we'll be certain to let you know. He took that as a threat. Two days later, on October 19th, he spelled out what happened in the meeting in an email and sent it to three people. He wanted the email released in the event that anything should happen to him. Ali Dayan Hassan of Human Rights Watch was one of the recipients. In the presence of those threats, uh, at least one threat was recorded by him, minuted and emailed to me. And in addition, I'd spoken to him several times on the telephone and he had told me that he had been threatened subsequently as well. So if someone is alleging that they are being threatened by a particular party and they're being threatened with being killed and then they are killed, then at least that party is a suspect in that crime. Six and a half months after that meeting, when Osama bin Laden was killed, the ISI came under enormous criticism for either not knowing bin Laden was living under their noses or for sheltering him there. Three weeks after that, an Al-Qaeda attack on a naval base in Karachi killed at least 10 people. Five days later, on May 27th, Shahzad published the first of a two-part story citing intelligence sources saying Al-Qaeda had infiltrated the Pakistani Navy. He did not live long enough to file the second story. 
He disappeared on May 29th, and when his battered body was found two days later, the email on his meeting with the ISI was made public. Here is a man who is speaking from the grave. He has left three uh, emails with three independent authorities, and he himself has pointed towards the ISI. He himself has talked about veil threats and about three separate occasions where he's had these kind of threats. So the first pointer comes from the deceased journalist himself. Pakistani reporters have good reason to believe Shahzad wrote that email because they say he's not the only journalist to be threatened by the ISI. Umar Chima, a correspondent for the news, has his own story to tell. I was abducted, um, I was muffled, I was handcuffed, and then I was taken to a place where uh, I was stripped naked and I was tortured. You know, like Salim, I know what people I was dealing with, and I also know that uh, where the threat uh, could be coming from. Uh, I was writing about the civilian government, I was writing about the army, I was writing about the intelligence agencies. Journalists in Pakistan are very familiar with the modus operandi of the ISI. There was the former editor of the Herald magazine. He talked about the time when he received uh, a phone call in which uh, he was asked if his family is well. You know, so I mean, sort of these kind of threats, I mean, you know, they're, they're very obvious. They're, they're something that, that Pakistani journalists have lived with. There is no proof that the ISI is responsible for the death of Syed Salim Shahzad. The evidence is entirely circumstantial. But that has not stopped Pakistani journalists from drawing their own conclusions, both on who they think killed their colleague, as well as on what the implications are for them and their reporting. The message, I think, uh, that is always sent is that journalists must toe the line or must work within the parameters established by Pakistan's national security establishment. This is something that has uh, always been what they have desired. Senior reporters and editors have told me that Salim Shahzad's death has caused them to ask some very hard questions about the way they operate. And I think that unfortunately we're going to see a reduction in the reporting space here in Pakistan, perhaps less probing journalism, perhaps a lot more caution on the part of the newspapers and reporters about who they ask questions of and what sort of questions they ask. And finally, words of sympathy and comfort. In the statement to the APP, that anonymous ISI officer said, the intelligence agency offers its deepest and heartfelt condolences to the bereaved family and assures them that it will leave no stone unturned in helping to bring the perpetrators of this heinous crime to justice for what that's worth. Pakistani journalists, they are killed like straight dogs. They are not considered human beings uh, from 92 onward. We have 74 of our colleagues murdered and not in a single case investigation has reached to the stage of prosecution. Only one case and that was Danny Paul and he was American journalist. He was not Pakistani journalist. In the cases that we have documented, the ISI operates on an assumption of impunity. They feel and consider themselves above the law and largely they have been. Salim Shahzad's case is a test case. If the government means business, if the government says they can hold uh, anyone accountable regardless of, of who they are for crimes committed, this is the time to show it. Our global village voices now on the killing and the state of the media in Pakistan. One of the first things I was told when I started reporting in Pakistan is that you cannot really honestly report on the military or any of its intelligence agencies. After the murder of Salim Shahzad, uh, this fact uh, really uh, rings home quite true and it's unfortunate because in the last uh, couple of weeks I've been seeing a lot of journalists who have been second-guessing themselves. Journalists covering militancies have often found themselves squeezed between militants and security agency personnel who are not happy with them revealing certain facts that they consider are damaging. In case of Salim Shahzad, I think there's been more outrage because this is the first time that security personnel have been directly called responsible by proof that was left by Shahzad himself. Pakistani army and the ISI protect the boundaries and sovereignty of Pakistan. It naturally attracts the enemy to engage them, but also the media has not played a very positive role, but rather a frivolous and unproductive bashing of both the army and the ISI. 
media should understand that this red line of country's security and sovereignty must never be crossed or compromised. Time now for listening post news bites. Syria is in a state of confusion. There's a lot of contradictory reporting coming out of there, including the case of Amina Araf, who blogs under the name Amina Abdullah. Araf is well known in the Syrian blogosphere for her blog, A Gay Girl in Damascus. She's an outspoken feminist, lesbian, and political activist. A woman claiming to be her cousin wrote on that blog on June the 6th that Araf had been taken into custody by three armed members of Syria's security services. That news was reported around the world and a free Amina Facebook page appeared that gained thousands of followers. That's where the story began to unravel. This woman sitting alongside me here has uh, been abducted in Syria, probably by government agents. In fact, as you can see, uh, she's here in the studio. In fact, she's never even been to Syria. The photographs were not of Araf, but actually of a British-based woman named Yelena Lecic, who appeared on the BBC to say the images were lifted from her Facebook page by persons unknown. I have no clue. I never met Amina. I'm not part of her blog. It's absolutely astonishing. They, um, somebody's been using my pictures and obviously campaigning with my face on it. Then Robert Mackey of the Washington Post reported that some writing on Araf's blog had appeared on an earlier 2007 blog which warned of content being a mixture of fact and fiction. Another blogger then went on Twitter to ask whether anyone had actually met or interviewed Araf in person. To date, no one has answered yes to that question. Who was Amina Araf, and is she really in the hands of Syrian security forces? The online debate over her true identity is typical of the difficulties of sorting fact from fiction in the Syrian story where President Assad's regime continues to crack down and where opposition activists cannot really be blamed for not identifying themselves. Another Mexican newspaper has been targeted in an attack. This one in the state of Coahuila involved a grenade. There were no casualties, but the Mexican media report that more than a dozen news outlets in the country have been terrorized in similar ways. It's a favored intimidation tactic of drug gangs who don't want their crimes reported. A few days after that attack, the body of Noel Lopez Olguin, a reporter for the newspaper La Verdad de Halpitan, was discovered buried in a grave in the state of Veracruz. Olguin had been missing since March this year. A drug gang leader arrested by the Mexican army has allegedly confessed to that murder, the 12th killing of a journalist there since 2010. One person's terrorist is another person's award-winning journalist. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been awarded the prestigious Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism. The judges said Assange's work on his whistleblowing website in exposing classified information to the public was a truth-telling that has empowered people all over the world and that Assange represents that which journalists once prided themselves in. He's brave, determined, independent, a true agent of people, not of power. This is a British award. Assange is currently in the UK, where he is appealing a court decision to extradite him to Sweden over allegations of sexual assault. One of the world's most influential newspapers, the New York Times, has made a bit of history by appointing the first female executive editor in the paper's 160 years of existence. Jill Abramson has been managing editor since 2003 and will move into the top job in September. She is replacing Bill Keller, who has steered the paper through eight often tumultuous years. Just last month, Keller again expressed his regret over the Times' misleading pre-Iraq war coverage, including the reporting on weapons of mass destruction by former Times writer Judith Judith Miller. He called it one of the low points of his tenure. In 2004, the Times published an editor's note admitting that many of its pre-war stories about WMD in Iraq had misrepresented the situation leading up to the 2003 invasion. It's one of those cases that raises questions about power, money, and the role of women in society. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi is going on trial, accused of paying for sex with a woman who prosecutors call an underage prostitute. When an American reporter wrote about the case and also looked at the depiction of women on Italian television, the journalist got leaned on by Italian police. Well, we're beyond the polizia's jurisdiction, so we're doing the story. If you've never been to Italy, never sampled what's on television there, prepare to be surprised, titillated, outraged, or all of the above. 
the depiction of women on Italian television is openly and unabashedly sexist. And remember, this is an industry in which Prime Minister Berlusconi, a media mogul turned politician, is enormously, disturbingly influential. He owns three television channels, big ones, and as Prime Minister effectively controls three more state-owned outlets. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now with a closer look at the representation of women in Italian media, how some women are trying to change that, and what they're up against. Switch on the TV in Italy. You'll be bombarded by images of women. Whether they're dancing, talking on chat shows, or doing weather reports, they're almost always young, their clothes are almost always revealing, and they're on the air at almost any time of the day. There is a, a scene where a girl was pushed into a shower and was in a sort of uh, obliged to take a shower. Everybody could see through her dress, and this happened for a long time every Sunday at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when the families and the children are in front of it. It, it was really very embarrassing. Putting attractive people on TV is not unique to Italy. That happens just about anywhere. But Italian programmers take it to a level that's almost shameless. Evening TV schedules are dominated by shows hosted by middle-aged men, fully clothed, surrounded by young women showing lots of skin. The output on Italian television offended Barbie Nadeau, an American journalist based in Rome. She wrote about it for Newsweek magazine, detailing the sexism she sees on Italian TV. I had described the women as sort of decoration, useless, voiceless, senseless. I alluded to the fact that that creates an, an environment of subliminal sexism and that that does carry through, you know, based on many, many studies, that carries through into everyday life in Italy. Nadeau pegged her story to the country's Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, who is currently grappling with a sex scandal of his own and whose TV empire media set regularly airs the sort of output that Nadeau found so troubling. When that issue of Newsweek hit the magazine stands, Nadeau found the Italian police at her doorstep. Two police officers came to my house one evening when I was making dinner for my children and they told me to come down to the police station because I was being investigated for criminal slander for what I had written about a television station in Italy, a television station which runs on Berlusconi's media set. It isn't just outsiders who are offended by what they see on TV in Italy. Italian filmmaker Lorella Zanardo produced a documentary on the subject. I have been living abroad for a long time and every time I came back I, I switched on TV and I said, what is it? So I was telephoning to everybody and saying, listen, if there is a girl hanging like a ham, let's do something. And everybody was like, no, it's normal. There is something that only Italians have, Italian TV has, it's humiliation. You don't find this... Uh, programs only in late night shows. They are broadcasted all day long, both on private and public TV. Even the most intelligent women on TV feel obliged to wear high heels and low cut suits. Obviously, nothing similar happens on the other side. Male politicians don't feel the need to go on air wearing their shirts half open, exposing their chests. But in Italy, as soon as you bring up issues like this, you are accused of being moralistic and bigoted. How is it that a sophisticated country known for producing fine art, the best in fashion, high-performance cars, excellence in so many creative areas, has found its TV sets filled with such lowbrow sexist product? One theory says this phenomenon has its roots in print and goes back decades. In the 80s, there was an explosion of weeklies like Panorama and L'Espresso. They battled for readers using pictures of women on their covers. Even if the main topic was inflation, they would find a way to use an image of a woman on the cover. Now you can complain about these magazines, but when they sell two or three times as many copies compared to the week before, it's something to reflect on. Italian magazines thrived through titillation, and TV seemed to follow. Silvio Berlusconi's company, Mediaset, Italy's largest commercial broadcaster, was founded in 1978, and it went with the same formula. 
But Italian television doesn't limit the eye candy to game shows or scripted programs. They fill primetime schedules with low-cost talk shows using the same tempting template. And it's been that way for decades. We try to imagine for women now 30 or 25 or 20, these people have been growing with this TV. And so when I speak with them, they think it's normal because they have been watching two, three, four hours of this TV every day since 15 years. So this has provoked a really a sociological change. Preferisco non guardare la televisione. I prefer not to watch TV because of the way women are shown. I think women are represented better in some of our arts, like theatre and art, compared to TV. I think TV programs are designed for the viewers. People are looking for something specific, and TV channels that want good ratings will present what the audiences want. But there are attempts to change that mindset. Last year, the Parliament created a panel to monitor content on state-funded Rai TV, especially for female stereotyping. Rai TV's new contract includes a provision for a committee that will monitor how women are presented in their programmes. This is surely an achievement, a big achievement. But the Berlusconi government's anti-sexism panel is mandated to look at only state-funded television. So the channels Berlusconi himself owns are beyond the reach of the government he controls. That means they can keep doing what they've been doing. One gets the feeling that if Italy's sexist TV problem is ever going to change, it won't happen on the watch of this media mogul come prime minister. I think you see a lot of movement, at least in the right direction. Right now, lots of the organizations support women in a, in, by protesting, by writing letters, by doing documentaries, by, by you know, shining a light or focusing on the problem. But it's going to take more than that to change the problem. More Global Village Voices now on women and the Italian media. I think the way Italian women are portrayed on Italian television is very degrading, unfortunately. And I think the message women and young girls get from these sort of programs is that you just need to have big boobs and big lips, maybe bump up by a bit of plastic surgery to make it on TV. Women uh, on Italian television are portrayed essentially as sex objects. The intended viewer uh, in mind for program designers and makers is the heterosexual Italian macho male. So women are on programs to titillate males. Finally, if you're one of the relatively few smartphone owners who doesn't play the game Angry Birds, then this video is going to require some explanation. Angry Birds is a mobile phone game that's gone viral. Since its release back in 2009, 12 million copies have been bought by iPhone users alone. In the game, angry, wingless birds try to get back their eggs, which have been stolen by a group of evil green pigs. Got that? Now, someone's taken this game, politicized it, and turned it into a commentary on the Arab uprisings. And with nearly two million hits on YouTube, it's a timely and technological web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Don't mix.